I'm Jim Whaley. On this Cinema Showcase, it's my pleasure to welcome a very fine actor, Mr. John Eric Exum. He's known for the TV series Voyagers, for the very popular TV film Making of a Male Model, and right now he's filming the feature-length film The Bear, the story of Bear Bryant. Join me as I talk with John Eric Exum on this Cinema Showcase. Thank you very much for joining Cinema Showcase. And join me right now in welcoming to the program, John Eric Exum. Very good to see you. Thanks for being here. Nice to be here. Thank you very much. And I must say the, the hairstyle is somewhat different than I think all of your, uh, <laughs> your fans are accustomed to. It's start, just... Trying to start a new trend in America. <laughs> well, I think it, it, could, I mean, it could catch on. Who knows? It was a shocking experience. We sat there yesterday and went through it, <laughs> chopped the thing off. But it had to be done. Now, everybody, I assume, will... Um, well, no, this is for the movie you're doing, The Story of Bear Bryant. I hope so. Uh, <laughs> you play in, in The Bear, uh, one of his great discoveries. Tell us something about the character you play. Uh, Pat Trammell was the, the first athlete recruited by Bear Bryant when he first came to Alabama from Texas. Um, he wasn't a, a great athlete, wasn't super fast or particularly strong or a particularly good passer or anything. The only thing he really did was win. He was a great leader great motivator, great intimidator, uh, a bit intense, a bit do in domineering sometimes, mm -hmm. uh, very much like Bear Bryant. And I think that's why he liked him so much. Patron was real tough, and, and the bear was very tough, mm -hmm. and, and just respected that in Pat Trammell. And he, he did very well and, and ran the team, and they became very close for uh, that and other reasons, I suppose. Now, that's an interesting point. Uh, and something I'm sure we could go into it at, at great depth for those people interested in Bear Bryant. How close did he actually become to his players? Well, while they were still playing for him, even his coaches weren't very close to him. He maintained a, very much of an uh, officer and, and uh, soldier relationship with the people that worked for him. He was somewhat aloof. Uh, motivated a, a little bit by fear and intimidation. And, and respect, but didn't want people to get too close to him. Uh, I spent some time in Birmingham and Tuscaloosa and talked to people that had played for him and coaches that had played for him. And very few were very close to him until after they stopped playing. And then they would often come back and, and he'd go out to dinner with them, see their families. Uh, he was a very warm person and, and helped people very much. But while they were playing together and while they were working together, he was very businesslike. Things were business. You go and you talk about mm -hmm. business and you, you work on the field. And you don't really socialize at that time. So the general feeling then would be one of, uh, of aloofness while he's working, but uh, yeah, well, he warms except, up. He warmed up later, but yeah. he, except that was the difference with Pat Trammell because the quarterbacks would always eat with the coach. You know, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. They, you know, they'd have lunch on the training table, and the quarterbacks that were going to play, and the captains of the the, the upcoming game would eat with Bear Bryant, and since. Tram was the quarterback, he ate with him all the time and talked to him, you know, just like he talked to his other friends. I mean, everybody would serve uh, Paul Bryant to death, though Pat did not. In fact, someone, uh, Darwin Holt, who played with the team, told me a story that they, they were sitting there, and Billy Neighbors was there as well, who was an All-American lineman for Alabama. And uh, Bear Bryant wrote out a play on a little napkin and, and pushed it over to... Uh, uh, Pat Trammell, who was just eating away, not really paying any attention to the coach, and Billy Neighbors was being real careful, you know, because everybody was a bit intimidated by his presence. And the bear said to him, he said, well, what do you think, Pat? You think, what do you think about this play? You think that'll work? And Pat Trammell kind of looked at her and just kept on eating and said, I don't think it'll work worth a damn. <laughs> and, the, and the bear didn't say a thing, just took it and crumbled it up and threw it in his tray, Jeez. got up and, and left. But nobody spoke to him that way, yeah. except yeah. Pat Trammell. And I think that's what he respected about him, too. He was very direct. Right when he was a freshman, we just like look him right in the eye and, and talk to him about whatever, but wasn't intimidated by the bear. What was the general reaction when you did uh, your research in Alabama? 
when the people you were talking to found out you were involved in this film about this Alabama legend? I was a bit surprised. I, I figured people would be impressed, but they didn't seem to be really. They were just like, they say something like, uh, oh, that's nice. Uh, you know, I wouldn't say a whole lot, and then I'd get the conversation going, and we would talk about them. And they were, they were civil enough and would speak to me about the bear. I went down to the 1961 reunion for the 1961 national championship team and met all the people on the team that had played with Pat Trammell. And they spoke to me and, and eventually warmed up, I suppose, but they didn't seem particularly impressed or interested. I was dismayed to find out. Mm -hmm. But there was I, no animosity that... Uh about how Bear was going to be portrayed. Well, there was, there was a little bit of, uh, I suppose, tr <coughs> trepidation in, in their minds about, you know, you all better do him right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You better do Pat Trammell right. Though I think there was a little bit of a competitive atmosphere, too, with some of the other players. Like, who's going to be in this movie? You know, Pat Trammell's got a big part in it. What about me? Yeah. Yeah. And there were a lot of other very good players. And, and Bryant had so many All-Americans and, and great players and people that went on to be very successful. So it's very difficult to make that choice. Yeah. Though I, it's more of a personal choice, I suppose. There are, there's a great many players in the, in the movie. I think Pat Trammell's prominence is because of the personal relationship he had with yeah. them. Not so much what he accomplished on the field, mm -hmm. though that was a lot. You know, there are really two schools of thought on whether an actor should do a lot of independent research if he's portraying an actual person or whether he should uh, rely on what the script gives him to work with. Now, obviously, you felt it necessary to <coughs> do independent research and so forth. Why did you think that necessary? <laughs> I don't know. It seemed like the artsy thing to do. <laughs> you know, run down to Birmingham and hang out at Tuscaloosa. I st you know, stayed with Pat Trammell's son for a couple nights, and we went around the, the school and met all the people in the 61 team, met his widow, because he died of cancer in 1968, um, met everybody I could just to get a feeling of who he was, and I, I think it's helpful, though I, I certainly have to follow the script in, in some ways, and, and there are some contradictions. And I'm not saying who's right, I don't know who's right. And in, in another sense, after I've done that, I've forgotten about it. Yeah. I learned what I could, you know, and inculcate that into whatever character you're going to portray, and then I just go with what feels right for the scene, and what's important in the scene. And, and a lot of this movie, what, what is not so much important is the, 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 the facts, what happened in Bryant's life, what happened in Trammell's life. What's more important is, is who Bear Bryant was and who Pat Trammell was and what their relationship was. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the, about, it's a movie about the people, not about what year he won what in. So after a while, I just try and, and uh, be true to the scene. And also... Do a, a good job and make it interesting, which is, I, I suppose, um, requires a little dramatic license. Oh, sure. sure. Which is a, a, a little bit of a betrayal to truth, but... Um, well, I mean, you are, after all, making an entertainment, so... Yes. Yes. And, and I also, it's because that through line of what is really important yeah. that, I, that I consider more than anything else. Yeah. But, but by and large, I think the, the movie is very accurate. All right, now what about people who aren't particularly interested in sports? What, uh... Well, oh, I don't think that matters at all. It, this is not a sports movie. Mm. It's, it's a movie about people and, and motivation and character. And it just happens to, to be within a, 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 uh, an atmosphere of sport. I mean, Paul Brandt could have been a great accountant or, or a, a great general or a great doctor anything that's not really what mm -hmm. is important yeah. it's it's how he, he motivated other people and how he helped them out and and uh, what kind of person he was i don't i don't think that's really something that's going to turn people off or it yeah. shouldn't it's it's not going to get in the way of the message of the movie of course if you love football it helps a lot <laughs> you know there's an awful lot of football in the movie yeah yeah you are working in this movie with a very fine director, Richard Serafian. Yes. He's one I've admired for, for quite some time. Does it help, uh, this is a silly question, but does it help to have complete trust in your director? Yeah, incredibly, sure. Because so often, you know, all the time, directors are going to tell you certain things. Well, sometimes they won't. And then you're really on your own. 
uh, so especially if, you, if you're in a project that, that, that's low budget and you have very little time and you have to d do more your own. The director is more concerned with getting the, the day's work done and watching camera movements and, and the, the technical aspects of making the film. But when a director does tell you things, which is, is usually the case, you have to decide whether to take their direction or not. And when the, when the direction is somewhat nebulous, uh, you know, when it refers to sincerity or, or the, a very slight difference in the way you read a line or what your motivation will be, what you're thinking of when you're, when you're saying that line or, or what the real purpose of the scene is, it's something that, that isn't very obvious. They're not going to really know sometimes whether you're doing it or not. I mean, most good directors w will, mm -hmm. but in, in in that case, you have to you have to decide whether to take their direction or not. And if you trust them a whole lot, it's it's much easier because you can just go with it. All right. Now, suppose there is a difference of opinion, and um, you say, "Could we try it one more time?" Is Rafi the type of director who will give you that kind of free reign to let you do it one more time, or? Uh, yes and no. I, he will. He'll let you do it again. But he knows what he wants, mm -hmm. and he's going to get what he wants. And a good director should be like that. Problem is, I know what I want, <laughs> and I know how I want to do it. Most of the time, so a, there can be a little bit of a, a difference of opinion, though the director is the boss and should be the boss, and if he's a good director, will in, insist on that. You know, one thing that has always been difficult for me to understand is how a director like and this is the classic example, and the one I, I generally use, Alfred Hitchcock, who has made, who made some of the greatest films in Hollywood's history. Mm -hmm. um, but who was always known to more or less exclude his actors. I mean, he came to that set knowing precisely who was going to move where, on, on which beat, almost. Actors uh, are props. Yeah, and it seems to me that's cutting out a very, very important aspect to the creative process, and that is what your actors can contribute, and yet who can deny the brilliance of Hitchcock's pictures? Yes, and, and the performances that, that sure. he got from actors. So in, in that sense, you can argue that it's, it's the end that, that justifies the means. And if it worked for him, I suppose it was effective and, mm -hmm. and good. Though everything I've read about him, I, I don't think I'd get along with the guy at <laughs> all. Yeah, I mean, I, I remember uh, there was some story I heard that w of an actor that, that I won't name that walked up to the door of the limousine because he would direct often with the videos in the limousine. He would just drive up next to the studio, would not even get out. In fact, Shirley MacLaine said she never spoke to him once hmm. when she did her, her first film with him. Yeah. yeah. And the, but one actor walked up to the limousine and, and knocked on the door, and, and uh, you know, the door comes down like about three <coughs> inches. He says, yes. And um, the actor asked him something about the scene and about the character. And, the, and he didn't say a word. The window just goes up, and he was fired the next day. You know, which seems to be a bit, a bit inflexible to me. Just a bit. You now, know, though, I don't know. Some actors, some directors are like that, and other directors talk a whole lot. I mean, what what matters is the product. I mean, it's important how you treat people. Always is. But but basically, as far as the the job is concerned, if the if the product is it's good. It's difficult to argue with their methods. That, yet I have talked to actors, and a number of actors, who say they would, they would rather work on a happy set, and come out with a less than perfect product than work on an unhappy set with a tyrannical director and come out with a perfect piece of work. They say because if you're going to spend six months, eight months, whatever, making a film, why put yourself through that torture if it's going to be uh, that bad? Well, I don't know if I have enough experience to have a. A very dependable opinion about that, but uh, I, I would rather make a good movie. Mm. I don't care if people are nice to me or not. It's nice if they're nice to you, but it's not that important. You know, my friends with my friends, my family, and and uh, other people, I'm not that sensitive about. So you could do good work then for a director you didn't particularly care for. Sure, and possibly have. <laughs> yeah, because most of the time, I mean, people show up on the set, and there's not a whole lot of socializing, and mm. I, you don't see people much after the job. And, and my only concern, often I'm not that friendly because I'm, I'm thinking about what I have to do. And I want to sit around and, and talk. And I just, I want to get a, a good project because it's what I'm interested in. And I want to get a, a next job and, and, and do good movies and, I don't know, leave something behind, yeah, you know. Yeah. So I'm not, I not, wouldn't be that concerned yeah. with people being friendly to me on the set. And they, I think most, more often than not they are. I've got to ask you about um, 
your TV series Voyagers. Uh, many of these programs I enjoyed very much. How did that series come about for you? I uh, got out of school in 1980, went to Michigan State, and spent about eight months in New York, at uh, which time I got a lot of development deals and soaps, uh, a couple of replacements for Broadway shows. Not great opportunities, but good opportunities, especially considering the, the brevity of the time I spent in New York City. Though I didn't take them, because I would still be doing a soap now. And, uh, and much of the, many of the development deals you can sign up for and, and not work. And if you do work, you don't have very much choice of what you work in. You certainly can't work for any other studio or network. Mm -hmm. So I came out to L.A. after that. I went, well, I did summer stock in the summer and came out to L.A. And had met a lot of people at NBC, and I, I really at all the networks, and tested for a few things. And when, th when this show came up, I was talking to the development people and saw it and, and read it. I loved the script. And I liked it a lot. Phineas Bogg, the character I played, the, the wayward pirate of the 16th century. And I bugged them to death to let me read for it. And they wouldn't because the guy was supposed to be 40 years old, beard and mustache, a real mundane, weathered pirate. And I said, well, I'll put the beard on. And we did all that. I put the beard on, the mustache. I got a scar on my face and everything. And they eventually let me read. And they liked the reading. And we eventually took off the mustache and the beard and all that sort of thing, though I had read seven times before I got that. Okay. You know, it was a harrowing three-week experience. Mm -hmm. But it always is. It, it always is. And uh, they, they broke down and gave it to me, though there, was a, there were many people that didn't think it would work that way. Mm -hmm. And the script had to be rewritten. Because the kid was only nine years younger than me when, when we did it, Mino Palouse. Was it a tremendously difficult experience uh, physically? Because many of the episodes I know required a great deal from you uh, physically. Well, not really. I, I was ready for a lot of that. I played mm. football at Michigan State, and wrestled there, and, and, and I dove there. And besides, I don't really do much. The stuntmen do most of it. Every two weeks, I would sneak in a stunt here and there, and then they, yeah. uh, we'd get in trouble and get yelled at by the producers, and they threatened to fire the stunt coordinator. And then we'd say, well, I promise I won't do a thing. So I wouldn't do a thing for two weeks, and then we'd do something else, and we'd get in trouble again. Now, it was very difficult to play the hero when you're just sitting on the sidelines drinking coffee. You know, it could, just doesn't really... And I, because then I go in, and they do the close-ups of the fight, and they spritz your face with water so you look sweaty, and you hold your breath for a few minutes so you can breathe heavy. It ain't too real, <laughs> you know, especially if you're into the method. It's difficult. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, and I, and I may be wrong about this, but wasn't Voyagers one of the series that some group said was entirely too violent to be on television? Yes. A, a, a totally a, a absurd contention, which I'm sure embarrassed them to death, the National Coalition Against TV Violence. And the reason they, they came up with, it, with that rating was because they don't consider context. And if I would take a, a, a you know, we'd, I mean, you watch the show, it was, it was a fun show that, that, I mean, that treated history with not really you know, malicious intent. There was some violence. We would fight with some pirates, though I never shot anybody, never hurt anybody. I would take pirates by the nose, you know, and kind of pull them off the rock and they'd hit the water. But they would, they would mark down each one of those, those little violent events and add them up, and it turned out to be 37 average per hour, which was the most on any TV show. But the, the point was it was, it was not intent. Mm -hmm. it, was, it, was, it wasn't... It, it wasn't malicious violence, so it was very misleading. That was wonderful publicity. I didn't care. I've often felt, though, that, that organizations and coalitions like that have so little use. Well, the... Uh, Except maybe to gener generate publicity. The attempt is honorable. <coughs> if, the, if they're seriously concerned with uh, lessening the violence on TV, so that doesn't encourage people to be violent in their yeah. private lives away from the TV set. No. Though I think they're often ineffective, poorly organized, and, and misdirected. Though the, though the, the attempt is honorable, mm -hmm. uh, they, just, they just have to hone their organization. I, I don't, I don't, well, you, I wonder don't how honorable some of, you wonder how honorable some of them can be. Uh, more often than not, it, it, it's a religious organization who merely wants to inflict their particular viewpoint on, on the television public. Yeah, well, it gets intrusive yeah. and self-righteous, as do most causes at one time or another. It's not a reason to give up the cause, mm -hmm. but uh, only to put it in perspective. Yeah. If this were the, um, the 1930s or 40s, you would undoubtedly be called by the fan magazines a matinee idol type. Now, has it ever bothered you that your looks might typecast you? 
Has this been a, any source of concern for you? Well, it certainly has. I've, I've lost quite a few jobs because of it and bec because of uh, uh, prejudice, you know, that, that I'm, I'm not right for, for certain parts. And in some senses, it's justified because the people that have to be convinced ultimately are the audience. And if they don't, don't buy it, you don't sell tickets, you don't make money. And you can't pay your dividends, and that is the bottom line. Though uh, the people are kind of running scared a bit in the casting departments in L.A. and won't take a chance, it'll be okay. I, can, I, I will work through it. Maybe my haircut will help. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, you know, it is a problem. One actor I have always admired for uh, being able to, if this is the word, transcend his good looks and do whatever kind of role just about he's wanted to do was Paul Newman. Mm -hmm. uh, because you think back on pictures like, um, I don't know, what Hemingway's Adventures of a Young Man, where he uh, played a, a beat up prize fighter or something. Mm -hmm. uh, he's been known to do all kinds of things with makeup. Yet, you know, there's still certain things even that Paul Newman couldn't do. I mean, I couldn't see him, and I could not see you as the Hunchback of Notre Dame or, or something like this. True. Well, there are some limits, but they're not nearly as vast as, as most people assume. And the, the, the first thing to do is to give it up yourself, to not to view yourself as other people view you, and, and not be con concerned with the, with the angles and the lighting and the makeup and all that yeah. sort of thing, unless it's appropriate. And, and get into the role as much as possible and do what that character would do. And that's all you can do. And, and then and give it up. And then ultimately, if you have to, you produce yourself or, yeah. or you, you keep on people. Voyagers, I, mean, I, was, inc I was incredibly lucky to get that because I was not right for it at all. I wasn't 40, didn't have a beard, the mustache, the scar, none of it. You know, but they uh, eventually gave in. In fact, if you were going to make a first career move, it probably would have been the TV movie Making of a Male Model. Yes. Yes, um. and which I, w I would have had a lot of trepidation about if, if it were mm -hmm. prior to Voyagers. I think that turned out very well. That, um, I think dramatically, uh, it was a cohesive film, and it had, um, I think it has some very interesting things to say about the whole male model mystique. Yes, it was accurate for the most part. A little bit of a problem in that uh, it, it was overwritten as far as time was concerned. You know, you, on, on TV, we, we had a strict 96 minutes to get that whole production in there. Because, we're, you know, we're selling them commercial yeah. times for 100,000 bucks a minute. We don't want to give that up. So we had to cut out four scenes, and there are four crucial scenes that, that really were necessary to propel the storyline along. Mm. And we lost those. And uh, plus, it, w it was more exploitive than I anticipated. I mean, it was going to be exploitive. Mm -hmm. uh, when I saw the promos, I was a bit shocked. Mm -hmm. But well, that's obviously. okay. It's, it's, it's another thing to sort of get around and, and, yeah. and get past. But, but it, you just work on that. It obviously worked because it was, I think, the um, certainly one of the highest rated uh, programs on the air. No, yeah, it did, uh, it did wonderful. They, ABC knew what they were doing. They were very successful. They did a, they did a good job. Sure. What kind of roles would you most like to do? Um, if, you could, if you could choose, I mean, I know you have several things lined up right now, but if you could choose one from out of the blue that you might really want to tackle, have you given any thought to what that might be? The, the, the roles intrigue me most are the, the tragic heroes, uh, the realistic heroes that, that fight like crazy and, and, and achieve their potential, but it still isn't enough. You know? mm -hmm. They're all they can be, and yet not all they wish they were. Uh, in, in some senses, Rocky, though, he's more a classic hero than a tragic hero in, in the way it was portrayed. He, he could have been, but, but was not because of, of uh, changes in the storyline at the end. It was not originally written that way. Uh, though I, though I, like, I like Donald Sutherland very much and, and Dustin Hoffman. Very heroic, but, but very real. Mm -hmm. uh, I love Pat Trammell. The role I'm doing now is, is, a, is, a, is a great role. Um, the, the guy fights like crazy. He's not a great athlete. He's a good athlete, but he's essentially a leader, yeah. essentially a, a motivator, a little domineering, a little overbearing. Goes too far sometimes, but very, very intriguing. There's a lot of, a lot of heart, a lot of character. Yeah. You were telling me earlier, I was not giving anything away because we've already 
talked about the fact that uh, he died at the age of 29, mm -hmm. didn't he, in, in 1968, 69? 68. Um, and that was one of the first scenes you actually shot in the film, wasn't it? Yes, I, I seem to have horrible luck. Everything, everything we did, the first scene we, we shot on, on Voyagers, and the first job I had out in L.A. with the first time I'd worked with film, because before that, I, all I'd done was theater, and primarily musical theater. And the first scene we, we didn't know a thing was when uh, I, I lose the kid for the first time and he's going back to his parents and everything and we're supposed to cry and everything and, <laughs> and I gotta you know gotta hug the kid and can and convince him that it's the right thing to do even though I don't want him to do it you know and then play that contradiction real heavy and when we when we did making the male model the first shot we shot was when I leave when I go back to the ranch I just did hotel the first shot we we shot with Emma Sams who plays Holly on General Hospital was the scene where I kissed her four times and asked her to marry me at six <laughs> in the morning. And the first scene we shot on this was when I die of cancer and say, say goodbye to the bear for the last time. Horrible luck. Don't you wonder what goes on in the minds of the continuity people when they're making up these schedules? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I take that back. I don't mean that very seriously. <laughs> we have production people here. Um, th there's, there's a lot of things they, c they really can't control. Yeah. You, know, you have to you have to get things in on budget, and you have to schedule things when when they're appropriate. When you have the set, when you have the actors, and it's just something you have to put up with. Yeah. The films are shot wildly out of sequence anyway. You know, you're, it's the end of the picture, then it's the middle of the picture, then it's right after the middle of the picture, then it's the opening of the picture, then it's the fourth scene, then it's the second scene. It's it's nuts. I'm always you're always reading your your script, and and thinking what came before, yeah. what came after. And even though you've done the end of the, the last scene of the show, you can't remember that because you, it, you will anticipate it in this scene. Always trying to figure out where you are. We are out of time. Yes. This has been a very fast half hour, and I hope you've enjoyed it. Oh, I had a good time. Thank you. And I uh, wish you much success with the film, The Bear. We'll all look forward to seeing it. And if you're back in Atlanta, I hope you'll join us again. I will. Thanks Thank very you. much. My thanks to all of you. Until next time, good night. <laughs>